Hello lovelies, in this video the brilliant Dr Webwords is going to be taking you through all of AQA topic 6, so organisms responding to change in their internal and external environments. Now there are lots of things in here including all of the practicals, so what I want you to do is make notes as you go along and then when you get to the end what I want you to do is to pop over to my website, look at the section we've made for you of this topic on my website, and then go through and do all of the quizzes to check that you've got to the end of the video and you've understood everything ready for your exams. Plants can't move away or towards a stimulus. They can't get up and physically move themselves. They're not mobile organisms but they can change the way they grow in response to changes in their environment so if it's a movement towards or away from the stimulus that involves the whole organism moving then that is then a taxis if it's something where a plant is obviously just changing the direction of growth towards or away from a stimulus then it's a tropism and in the same way as the other responses the taxis and kinesis these can help plants increase their chances of survival. So for things that plants need, again, before it was thinking about predators, food, um, mates going towards resources that they need, similar for plants. So obviously they need more light because if they have more light, they can do more photosynthesis. If they have more water and minerals, obviously they need minerals, various minerals for growth and more stability. So I'm thinking about roots in the ground. So having a greater kind of connection to the soil and therefore holding their own if it's windy, if it's very exposed, um, if they're likely to be pulled up very easily or knocked over very easily. And therefore, if they were on the ground, they'd get less light. So being able to be supported is very important. So we're going to look at how different tropisms can help them achieve this. They are directional. So they are still directional, which is why they are a tropism. So they either grow towards or away from the stimulus. So that's the same thing as before. So towards will be a positive tropism, whereas away will be a negative tropism. But just in case, make sure this time we're talking about growth towards or away. We're not talking about movement towards or away, because that would suggest the organism is physically moving. OK, so in the same way as with taxis, the prefix in front of the tropism describes the stimulus that causes it. And again, remember, we can have positive and negative tropisms describing the movement towards or away. So we're going to have a look at four examples of plant tropisms. Again, most of these it would be good to learn because you are going to be given these as examples. There aren't many tropic responses in plants. So the more you can learn, the better you'll be able to identify them and then justify them. So the first one is probably the most obvious one, phototropism. So photo, again, that prefix meaning light. So we're going to talk about shoots and roots as separate entities when we talk about this tropism because they often have different responses. So shoots are positively phototropic. They grow towards the light and that makes sense because they want to maximise the light for both senses. Roots are negatively phototropic, so they grow away from the light which encourages them to grow down into the ground. That makes more sense. There are no chloroplasts in roots and they need to grow down because that means that they'll be growing away from the light, which suggests they're growing into the soil. And that's where they're going to need to grow to get more water and nutrients, etc. Geotropism, sometimes also called gravitropism. So geotropism or gravitropism is the growth towards or away from the field of gravity or the gravitational pull. So shoots are negatively geotrophic or gravitrophic. They grow against the gravitational field. They make sure they're growing above the ground towards the sky, so away from the centre of the earth to make sure that there's more light because again they need more light for photosynthesis. So if you were growing with gravity you'd be growing into the ground which is not what we want if we are a shoot. Roots are then the opposite. They are positively geotropic or gravitropic. That means they grow down into the ground and the deeper they go, the more likely they are to find more water, mineral ions, and also roots being sort of deep into the ground helps to stabilise the plant as well. So it means it's less likely to fall over, get knocked over in high winds. It gives this stability. So we've got negatively geotropic, shoot, geotropic shoots and positively geotropic roots. OK, this is probably a new one. You may well have heard of the others in when, if you talked about plant responses at Key Stage 3. But thigmotropism is 
interesting. It's talking about mostly seen in, in climbing plants. Not all plants can do this, but they have the ability to sense touch. So when they sense that they're touching an object, their shoots or their roots are touching an object, the growth of those can be stimulated to change. So there are specialised shoots called tendrils. You'll have seen these kind of they grow in a spiral. And then when they touch something that they could grab onto, they are able to sense where that is and grow in a spiral around it. So they grow around the object, which enables the plant to grip on and use that in order to reach high up and get more light. So these plants don't have tall, woody stems like trees that enable them to grow up really, really tall and straight. That all they have is they have a very sort of floppy, bendy stem, but they kind of grow in these little tendrils that can kind of creep up and grab onto. You've seen things like ivy, for example, will grow up and grab onto bricks and grow up the front and side of a house. That's able to do this because it can grab onto the, it can sense where the brick is, it can kind of grow in and around parts of the brickwork, hold onto it, put out more shoots, go up a bit higher, do the same, put out more shoots, go up higher, do the same. And that makes sense. You want to be able to grow up and get more light if you can, if you're a shoot. If you're a root, they tend to grow away from objects they touch, so they're negatively thigmotrophic. You'll see sometimes if a root grows down and hits a rock, it will turn to the side and carry on growing until it can grow down again. They won't try and grow through things if they can't or aren't able to. They'll tend to move away and grow in the opposite direction through substrate that they can get through. And lastly, hydrotropism. This is another one that kind of makes sense. So roots are positively hydrotropic, so they grow towards water in the soil. This helps to make sure that they get enough water, even in dry environments. So you can see here, my roots of my plant are bending towards that cup of water. They can sense increased water content in soil or in substrates, and they will grow towards it in order to try and maximise the amount of water the plant can get. This makes sense. So all of these are tropisms because they are all directional and the growth of the plant is changing. Okay, so plant responses are controlled by growth factors and we use the term growth factors here but they behave in a similar way to hormones. So they're hormone-like chemicals. They are produced at the tips of roots and shoots in the meristem. There's different classes of them and they can travel around the plant in diffusion, active transport or even in the vascular tissue if they need to. And we've got different groups uh, including auxins, gibberellins, abscisic acid, ethene. IAA is the example we're going to look at which is indoacetic acid and it's an example of an auxin. So it's within the group of auxins and it controls both photo and geotropisms or gravitropisms in both roots and shoots. So let's look at phototropism in shoots first. So the way it works is that IAA moves to the more shaded part of the shoot. So in this case, we've got the sun moving throughout the daytime and changing direction. So the sun is initially pointing straight down. So we have none of the tip is shaded any different to any of the rest of it. And then as the sun moves across the sky during the day, then we get a shaded side and a sunny side of the shoot tip. What happens is the IAA gets moved to the shaded side and that promotes the growth of cells on that side of the shoot, the elongation of those cells. And so that causes the shoot to bend towards the light because the same elongation is not happening on the sunny side of the shoot. So we get that bending, that bending of the shoot tip towards the direction the light is in. So this is obviously a tropism. We're positively phototropic here. We're moving the growth towards to make the growth happen towards the stimulus which is the light. Okay so moving on to negative phototropism in roots. So this is where we're obviously going to be growing away from the light and we said that roots are negatively phototropic so they're going to be growing away from the light because so they're going down into the ground. So in this case IAA moves to the more shaded side of the root still but it inhibits growth. So because it inhibits growth on that side the cells on the unshaded side elongate, whereas the shaded side does not, and therefore we're going to be bending down and away from the direction of the light. Okay, so then if we think about gravitropism or geotropism as well, it happens in the same way. So positive geotropism works in the same way as negative phototropism in roots because the IAA is going to move to the side that is lowest to the ground or, or closest to that gravitational pull. Again, it's going to inhibit elongation in those cells, whereas the elongation occurs in the 
sort of the side that's furthest away from the gravitational pull. And so then we get that movement down, sort of bending down and growing down towards the gravitational pull. So that's how the roots kind of go further into the ground. So mainly the remembering sort of facts here is to kind of think about where is the IAA going? And if it's moving, it's always moving to the shaded side or the side that's pulling down with gravity. But in shoots, it's promoting the elongation. So it will bend towards the light. In roots, it's inhibiting elongation. So then we bend away from the light or we bend down towards gravity. So that's the kind of thing to remember. So in shoots, IAA is causing elongation or promoting elongation in roots it's inhibiting elongation on that side and therefore the elongation occurs on the opposite side and we get bending away. Taxis and kinesis are animal responses to stimuli. So first of all, responses to stimuli might help to increase chances of survival by helping animals to avoid predators, avoid aromatic stresses and increasing access to resources. So avoiding predators literally just means they can run away, or they can move away from an the area. They can spend more time in somewhere that's covered or shaded or something, so that helps to protect them. Avoiding abiotic stress by responding to their environment surrounding, so they're being able to detect temperature, humidity, water availability, light, and move in accordance to how they need to, depending on those factors. And then increasing access to resources, so get more water, get more food, go towards where there might be mating opportunity. All of these will involve some form of movement and thinking about like migrations and things like that happen as well with things like this. So they make sure they move to where they know there's going to be more water. But what we're talking about here in terms of responses, we're going to be talking about some innate responses. So all animals have to respond to their environment and so do all plants. But we're going to be talking more about innate behavioural responses. So taxis and kinesis than kind of just general behavioural choices. So if you remember, hopefully from GCSE, a change to an internal or an external environment is what we mean by a stimulus. So there'll be some kind of change and their behaviour will need to be altered in response to that. And that's going to be their response. So in animals, obviously animals have motility. They can move. They are able to move towards or away from favourable or unfavourable conditions. They can get up and walk around or they can swim or they can fly. Um, So that's most of what we measure when we're measuring these responses in animals is we're measuring their movement. And there's two kind of focuses. One is direction and one is frequency of movement. And we'll look at those in a minute in more detail. With plants, plants can't get up and walk away. That's not to say plants don't move or can't move. They obviously can move various parts of them. And really what we mean by that is that they alter their growth. So they can change the direction or the type of growth that's happening at root tips and shoot tips in order to respond to changes in their environment or respond to stimuli. They can't physically get up and move their whole organism. Um, But obviously they have um, methods, some things in seed dispersal that can move seeds further away from them and potentially move the seeds to a more favourable environment when that happens. But as an individual plant living, they can't just get up and move around. So that's kind of going to affect the differences between the responses of these two types of organisms. We're going to look at animal responses in this video and then we'll move on to plant responses in the next one. Okay, so in mobile organisms, there are two types of innate responses which help them to survive taxis and kinesis, as we've said. Sometimes you'll see this word motile or they have motility instead of the word mobile. And obviously that just means they can move around. They have the ability to move. And so we're thinking about anything that can move. It's not just going to be animals. We're talking about things like swimming bacteria, and even it can be the case of individual cells. So obviously there are some cells in your body that can move around. White blood cells, for example, are another example that display um, taxes of some kind because they can move in response to a stimulus. So let's have a look at the two different types of responses. They are both innate responses, and that just means they're not learned. So these are responses that you're born with or an animal or an organism is born with. It's encoded in their kind of DNA to respond to certain conditions in a certain way when they are detected. That doesn't mean to say these aren't necessarily choices, but they're going to be ways of behaviour that have not been taught by another organism to them or they've, they've learned it from watching other organisms. It would have been ingrained in their DNA and that they would have been born with. 
Okay, so taxis, the taxis is the plural. So you have a taxis or the plural is taxis. A tactic response is directional. So taxis or taxis, a taxis is a directional response. So the movement has to be in a direction. The direction that the stimulus is coming from will determine the direction of the movement in response. So if the stimulus should, needs to be coming from a certain direction or you can be able to tell which direction it's coming from, then the response will either be to move towards that stimulus or away from that stimulus. And that means that the response is also directional. So the stimulus will have to be coming from a certain direction and then the response will be to move towards it or away from it. So the response has a direction. If an organism moves towards the stimulus, that is counted as a positive response for a positive taxis. If they move away, it's a negative response for a negative taxis. And that's how we describe the direction. Kinesis or kinesis, plural, is slightly different. They are somewhat more random and they are non-directional. And this will make a bit more sense when we go into some examples, but they do not rely on the direction of the stimulus coming from one place. It's about the intensity of the stimulus and how it affects the speed of the movement in response. So if this is sort of more examples of things like light, if they're Light can be directional, but things like temperature, humidity, but it can be in the whole environment in an area where it's not going to just be, you wouldn't have a temperature coming from a certain direction. Most likely you'll have hot areas and cooler areas and there'll be a gradient there. Same for humidity. So they're more likely to be able to follow a gradient of change, but there isn't necessarily going to be a direction for them to follow. So in those certain conditions, high humidity, low humidity, high temperature, low temperature, how intense the stimulus is, whether they want to be in that high temperature or want to be in that low temperature will affect how fast their response is. And this again will make a bit more sense when we go through examples, but basically if you think about it, if you're moving around in a random motion, more often if you're in an area that you don't want to be in, that is going to increase your chances of you being able to get out of that area faster. So if you move around slower in an area you want to stay in, you're less likely to accidentally wander out of that condition. OK, so let's have an example for taxis. So I've got my euglena here, which is a single celled photosynthetic organism. So it has the ability to photosynthesize. It's single celled. It's free living. It has a flagellum, so it is able to swim and move around. It has a photo or an eye spot which allows it to detect light and it demonstrates positive phototaxis which means obviously it moves towards light and this makes logical sense if my torch is shining in this direction the movement of direction will be towards the light it's positive phototaxis and this makes sense it has chloroplasts it can photosynthesize so if it's going to move in a direction it's going to move towards light to enable it to carry out more photosynthesis so that's my description of it and my explanation of why that phototaxis and that positive response makes sense there. So that's what kind of with taxis is uh, identifying as a taxis because the light is a directional stimulus and also the movement of the organism is in a direction and it's in response to it and it makes the response make sense. We can explain why they would demonstrate that response. Okay, so an example for kinesis. So this is going to be with wood lice. I'm going to look at this in a second with the practical. But for example, we put wood lice in a chamber, like a choice chamber that's called, where there's two conditions, light and dark, and you can track their movements. So the movement is random. It doesn't appear to be in a direction. Often they will just go round and round and round the environment. But it's more about their speed and how much time or how long they spend in each condition. So you can see here their speed and their amount of turning and their movement is faster in the light than it is in the dark. And that makes more sense. They are showing it's a random response, but the intensity of the light, so the light intensity, is dictating the speed of the movement. So in the light, they are moving faster. They are moving around more than they are in the dark. And that makes sense because if they're moving around slower when they're in the condition that they want to be in or vice versa, if they're moving around faster in the condition they don't want to be in, then that will allow them to move away and find a condition that's better suited. And when they do, when they're in the dark, they're moving slower because they're in a condition that is better suited to what they need. It allows them to make sure they spend more time in conditions where they're able to not lose water. So, for example, wood lice obviously have a solid exoskeleton. 
They can't lose water. They need to retain water to make sure it stays in, but they also need to respire and open their spiracles. So what they want to do is open that in a dark, cool, moist area in order to be able to not lose water loss and water too much. So therefore, this explains this behaviour. Most of the time you're going to be looking at the responses of invertebrates, so things like maggots or wood lice or flatworms, especially in the exam questions you're going to get asked as well. What we're going to look at an example is looking at taxes in wood lice by putting them into a choice chamber or a choice chamber like setup where they're going to have different conditions and they'll be monitoring their movement. And in theory, if they are going to be moving towards or away from a stimulus like we've talked about, then we will, should be able to predict where they're going to end up, what conditions they would prefer, and that would suggest that they are able to sense those conditions and then move accordingly. Obviously, we're all going to repeat this, especially with um, animal behaviour experiments or something where you're relying on organisms to do something. The more repeats you can do, the better, because they're not always going to behave in totally expected ways. Okay, so I am making up my little choice chamber here. Um, I've got four quadrants, and that'll make more sense once I put the lid on in a second. But you can see we've got dry here and dry here. This will be dry in the dark, because when I put the lid on, this is covered by the dark green paper. And then I've got the light square here as well. And then in these two, I've put some kitchen towel, and I've just made them wet with some kitchen towel, so it's going to be a damp environment. And again, I've got uh, dark this side and light this side. Put a thin layer of cloth inside the choice chamber for the wood lice to walk on top of so they they're not actively walking on the charcoal or walking on the wet areas okay so i've placed my cloth in and you can see hopefully if i spin it down that there's actually now a gap so there's a gap between the cloth and the lid so there's enough space there for them to walk around on but crucially my kind of surface isn't touching the wet and so it's not going to absorb that water but it's going to be near enough to it that they'll be able to sense the humid environment versus the dry environment and then you can see my lines on here and what we'll do is i'll put the wood lice in the center and then put the lid on leave it recording and and watch what happens and time it okay so that's me taking off the lid at the end so we can literally see which wood lice are in each quadrant at this point in time. Recording and making sure that you kind of, if you record it and film it at this time, then you can kind of be accurate because obviously with the black covering, it's kind of hard to tell who is in the black sections. So this is a good way of doing it and sort of filming it or taking a picture straight away, having someone else to help you to make sure that you can know they're not always going to stop moving. And this is one of the perils of working with moving organisms. Okay, so we've got our results, we move on to the analysis. I've drawn a really simple bar graph to help us kind of visualise our results. And the null hypothesis for this investigation would be that there'd be no difference in the number of wood lice in each section after 10 minutes. In, in that that's would be, so null hypothesis is always that there is no difference or no change or no relationship. So, however, obviously we can see that there is a slight difference. And this is expected because we know from taxis behavior and what wood lice environments they prefer they're going to hopefully directionally move away from light so demonstrate negative phototaxis because they prefer dark damp cool environments so anything that's light and dry they're going to want to move away from and they will demonstrate that behavior it's also likely that the wood lice are going to slow down or spend more time in the damp areas as dry environments, they're more prone to water loss. They obviously have hard exoskeletons and they need to be able to respire through spiracles. And so when they open those, they do not want to lose water. So if they're in a dry environment, that risks losing water. So they would spend more time in human environments. So being able to sense their environment and we expect them to move to where they will be more comfortable or demonstrate negative phototaxis away from light. Again, because it could be due to predation, but also because it means that they would end up in their favourable environment of being dark. So in order to test to see if these differences are significant, we need to do a statistical test. We can't just hand on heart say, OK, yeah, look, more wood lice went to the dark and damp and therefore they were demonstrating phototax negative phototaxis and they spent more time in the damp than in the dry. And so therefore that demonstrates and proves our hypothesis. We can't say that this data backs up that suggestion unless we do a kind of squared test in order to prove it and we're doing a chi-squared test because we have categorical data they were either in a section or not there was no in between
There are sensory receptors and these are specialized cells that can detect stimuli. And remember, stimuli is just meaning changes in the environment. So most can be described as transducers because they convert one form of energy into electrical energy in the form of a nerve impulse. So receptors in your ear, they detect changes in air vibration. So that's movement of the air. So kinetic energy to electrical energy. You've got stretch receptors in your muscles and they obviously detect the movement or stretch or elongation of muscle fibers. Again, kinetic or movement energy to electrical energy. You've got lots of different types of receptors in your skin. Most of them respond to things like changes in temperature, changes in pressure, whether it's light pressure or um, hard pressure, pain again. So there's pain receptors, again, hard pressure. And these then take those changes in, say, temperature, so thermal energy um, or movement or pressure energy into electrical energy as well. And then lastly, your eye. Hopefully this one's quite an easy one. So we have photoreceptors in the back of the eye in the retina and they detect changes in light intensity. So making sure we're talking about changes as the stimulus. So it's things that change and then how they turn that into an electrical impulse. So changes in light intensity generate an electrical impulse. And we'll learn more about specific types of receptors, including some that's found in the skin for pressure and the eye as well. Others detect the presence of chemicals. So in your nose and your mouth, it works slightly differently. So in your nose, you have something called um, olfactory receptors. They detect chemicals in the air that you breathe in through your nose. And then in your mouth, you have receptors in your taste buds. And these are both, they detect stimuli, but it's more that the chemicals bind to the receptors and that causes an electrical impulse to be generated. So it works slightly differently. It's not responding to a change in a type of um, energy. They are just responding to the fact that a receptor, something will bind to those receptors and that will cause the impulse to be triggered. So we need to think about and be able to explain how these sort of changes in a stimulus actually then leads to an electrical signal or what we mean here is like a change in ion movement and that change in ion movement create an electrochemical gradient. So what we mean is that well, the main way you describe it is potential difference. So in the same way we talk about voltage. So when there's a potential difference in charge across the membrane, so we've got more positive and more negative either side of the membrane, the cell membrane of the neurone, then we have a potential difference. So that's a voltage. And remember, charge is carried by ions that can move. And so that's that counts as electricity. So in this example, we've got the cell membrane of a neuron. We've got just a small section of it. The outside is more positive at the moment, it has a greater positive charge because there's more positive ions outside. And the inside is more negative then. It has more negative ions or fewer positive ions inside. And so it's about minus 65 millivolts is the potential difference across this membrane. We've got potassium channels, sodium channels, and then the sodium potassium pump. These are obviously all ion channels that are used to allow charged particles to move across the membrane. And when we're at resting potential, which is when no stimulus is happening, this is just the resting state, the neuron, the sodium channels and the potassium channels are both closed. And just the sodium potassium pump is working as normally as it would using some energy to move three sodium ions out for every two potassium ions in. So overall, we are moving out more positive ions than are being moved in. So three sodium are going out, two potassium are coming in. So that gives us and helps us to maintain that overall difference in the membrane where there's more negative inside and more positive outside. Or we can say more positive outside, less positive inside. And then that helps us to remember where there's more positive ions. Okay, so then what happens when the stimulus is detected. So the first, the, the stimulus starts to happen and it first starts to be detected by the receptors, we start creating what we call a generator potential. So you'll see here we've gone from minus 65 millivolts to about zero millivolts. So that means we've got more positive or we've got less negative. And the way that works is that sodium channels are opened somehow by the receptor. So the, res the stimulus is detected by the receptor and that opens or leads to the opening of sodium channels. So more positive ions are coming in 
So the inside of our neuron cell, the inside of the membrane becomes more positive. And that's how we get from minus 65 up to zero. So basically it means that we end up being about the same either side of the membrane. And the sodium ions, remember, have stopped being from being coming in up until this point because their channels were closed. So by allowing them in, they're just diffusing in down their gradient because there's a lot more of them outside than inside currently. So they're just going to diffuse in until we get equal. And then we move on to the action potential itself. So once we get to a point where we've potentially created a large enough stimulus to get over the threshold value. So the threshold, the generated potential has to be high enough and there has to be enough depolarization to get above the threshold value, which if we got to zero, we definitely would. And you can see the threshold on the graph down the bottom right. So if we reach this stimulus at the threshold potential because the stimulus is strong enough and enough depolarization of the membrane has happened, then even more sodium channels will open and even more sodium will diffuse in. Sometimes we say it's an influx of sodium because it just means there's so many sodium ions coming in to the cell, the nerve cell. So that means our membrane potential has passed the threshold level, even more sodium channels open, the membrane depolarizes even further. And then what happens is those sodium ions diffuse across. They diffuse to the right or to the left, depending on which way the signal is traveling. They will diffuse along inside the cytoplasm of the cell and create generator potentials further down by making the membrane potential depolarize as it goes down the neuron. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail when we look at nerve structure and how that happens. But the point is, is that once this action potential has started, if the threshold value is met, it just goes. We can't stop it at that point. So then we have to repolarize. So we have to return back to our resting potential by repolarizing the membrane, which basically just means the excessive positive ions are removed and we get back down to being down below about minus 50, minus 65. And we've gone from plus 40 at this point. So we've had such an influx of sodium during the action potential that we've gone all the way to plus 40 millivolts. Very, 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 very positive. And now we need to get back to minus 65. So to do that, we have to open the potassium channels and we close the sodium channels so we don't let them diffuse back in. And the sodium potassium pump gets back to work, putting out three sodium ions for every two potassium ions that are coming in. And then the potassium ions are also able to diffuse out of their own channels down the diffusion gradient. So they're able to just leave. So in total, that means we're kind of pumping out and diffusing out more positive ions than we are keeping. And so that works to eventually make our membrane potential go back down to about minus 65. And the important thing here is to note that obviously the sodium channels are closed. So at the peak of the action potential around three on the graph down the bottom, the sodium channels will close and the potassium channels will open. And then that will allow us to start getting back to resting potential. OK, so this is something we have to learn, this sequence, this order. We need to know how resting potential is maintained through the sodium potassium pump and which ion channels are open and closed. and for each stage and be able to describe what happens. And this graph, you might be able to match it to the graph or you might need to look at it as the diagram. Sometimes I've seen it as a table where you've got open, closed, open, closed, depending on which um, ion channel you're talking about, or it could just be the membrane potential numbers. So minus 65, zero, plus 40. But the other thing to know is that this action potential is an all or nothing response. So it's the same size. It always goes from about minus 65 to plus 40. It's never any higher than plus 40. And then it goes back down again. And it will always happen if the threshold is reached. So like I said, if we get past the threshold, there's no stopping it. It will happen. And an action potential will travel along the neuron. If the stimulus is too weak and we don't reach the threshold, it won't happen. So it is either it will happen because the threshold has been reached or the signal's too weak. It will not happen. There isn't an in-between and there isn't kind of a stronger action potential or a weaker action potential. There is no such thing as that. They're always the same in terms of the change in membrane potential. It's just about whether or not the threshold is reached by the generator potential. And if it is, great, then an action potential happens. If it's not, then the membrane potential just goes back down to resting potential and we don't have an action potential traveling along the nerve cell. Then we'd look at the Pacinian corpuscle. 
This one is found in the skin, quite deep in the skin and also in some joints as well. It's a mechanoreceptor, which is another way of saying it responds to movement or kinetic energy, like we said. And it's attached to a single sensory neuron, which will then link up and join up with others potentially to pass on the signal. We have the neuron or the nerve ending at the centre of this kind of whirl of layers of connective tissue. They're called lamellae. We've seen the word lamellae before. It's just a, use, a word used to describe layers of things. There's gel between those layers as well, which helps with the transport of ions. And then on the actual kind of micrograph, you can see at the bottom, you can kind of see these little dots. They kind of look like nuclei, but these aren't individual cells. They're kind of, they're called fibroblasts. They are the parts that are secreting these connective tissue layers. That micrograph, that is a cross section. And you'll see that the outermost layer is very thick and darker than the others. That is sometimes called the capsule. So the very outermost layer of uh, the Pacinian corpuscle is called the capsule. And then this is quite circular, this image, because actually this is a cross section. So that very, very central part is the axon that's been sort of cut through. A pressure stimulus pushes on the lamellae, which deforms the membrane of the sensory neuron. So you can see I've got to redraw my diagram with these layers that have been pushed down, deformed, pressed down, which is what happens when the pressure is applied. And this opens stretch mediated sodium ion channels, which is basically saying that when the membrane is pushed, that physical kind of pushing, pressing, moving of the membrane, stretching of the membrane, Literally, when it's stretched, they kind of push open or pull open those sodium ion channels, and that's how they open. So that force is going to physically open the sodium ion channels, which causes the influx of sodium ions, and they sort of push, they rush into the cytoplasm of the neuron cell, the axon in the middle. So at that point where it is depressed, that is going to cause depolarization of the membrane, and then hopefully a generator potential and the greater the pressure so the more areas of these lamellae that are pressed down and pushed down the more membrane is going to get deformed and stretched the more sodium channels will open and that makes sense because if you're going to deform more membrane or push or stretch more membrane more of the channels will be pushed or pulled open and therefore you're going to get more sodium coming in which means we're more likely to get a thresh meet the threshold potential and cause an action potential and if an action potential is then generated, the impulse is going to move down the neuron in this, where it's got it in this direction here. So down and away from the receptor, and then it will join up and link up. And that signal will be received as pressure. Okay, so today we're going to look at visual receptors. So many organisms across the kingdoms have photoreceptors to detect light, and in most cases they're found in some sort of eye or an eye spot. So we're going to look at the human eye. The photoreceptors in your eye can be considered transducers because they are converting light energy into electrical energies. When light enters the eye, it passes through the pupil, through the lens, all the way through the eyeball and hits the back of the eye, which is obviously the retina. It doesn't stop when it hits that first layer of the retina. It carries on through that layer until it hits the photoreceptors, which are at the back of this retina section. I'll show you with an arrow in a second. So that's the optic nerve at the front, all those bundles of nerves that join up to be the optic nerve. So it's got to pass over that or through that, past that, past all of these nerve neurons to the very back where you've got the ends of all of these photoreceptor cells. So the light passes all the way through this and goes, when we say to the back of the eye, we don't mean it just hits the retina, it hits all the way to the back of the retina as well. And that's where we have the light detecting pigments that are in these photoreceptor cells, so that's where the light gets absorbed. So the two types of photoreceptors we have are called rods and cones. So you see in this diagram, my cones are red and my rods are blue. So these are photoreceptors in that sort of kind of end part, the, the kind of long cylindrical part of the end of those cells, that's where the pigments are. The light, when it hits those pigments, causes a chemical change and alters membrane permeability to sodium ions. If that generator potential is high enough, if enough light hits the nerve cells, then we'll create the threshold potential. And then that impulse is going to be sent along the bipolar neuron and then to a ganglion cell and then to the optic nerve. So we've got our rods and our cones. If you follow them down, they're attached to either these blue or sort of red orangey bipolar neurons. So they're the cells that directly attach to the photoreceptors. 
And that's the journey that that electrical impulse is going to take in order to send that electrical impulse to the brain for our body to register that we've detected light and turn that into images. Okay, so we need to know in detail the two types of photoreceptors that we can find in the retina. So rods and cones are the two options that we have. Rods are mostly found around the retina edges and the cones are found closely, densely packed together in the fovea. Rods contain rhodopsin, which is the photosynthetic pigment that they have in the sort of pointy part and part of those cells. Cones contain a different type of iodopsin, red, green, or blue wavelength sensitive. So it detects that wavelength, colored wavelength of light. So you have red cones, green cones, and blue cones. Rods, because they only contain rhodopsin, they only detect what we say monochromatic vision, otherwise sort of known as black and white vision. So shades of light and dark and grays. Whereas the cones allow us to have our coloured vision, our trichromatic vision. The different wavelengths detected, red, green, blue, will, can mix and blend together. So if red and green cones are stimulated because the wavelength of light is yellow and that crosses over into both red and green wavelengths, then the brain will detect that as yellow. This is one of the structural things. So there are many rods, multiple rods joined to one bipolar neuron. They share in cones, each cone is connected to just one bipolar neuron. Because many rods share a bi bi bipolar neuron, they have low visual acuity. So it means that they cannot separate light from close objects that bounces off those rods or det is detected by those rods, the light, because they can't see them as separate objects because all three of those rods are very close together, but they only share one neuron, so they can only produce one action potential between them. Cones are the opposite. Because each cone has its own bipolar neuron, they are able to detect light from two close together objects and see them as separate objects, allow you to see them as separate objects because they can send individual action potentials for each object, even though they're close together. This is what we call visual acuity. So your ability to see kind of in high resolution in a similar way to light microscopes. Rods give us high light sensitivity because all three of those rods can detect the low light intensities, they can combine their weak action potentials or their weak signals into that one bipolar neuron, which will be enough to trigger an action potential. This is known as summation. Low light sensitivity is what happens with cones. They don't aren't able to detect really um, sort of low levels of light because they don't have any summation. So when light intensity hits it, it can't amplify the signal if it's a low light intensity because it can't combine signals to join to one bipolar neuron because there's only one attached to it. Control of heart rate. And we're going to focus on baro and chemoreceptors. The main part that you will be familiar with is the central nervous system, the CNS. So that's made up of the brain and the spinal cord. We have our central nervous system and then we have our peripheral nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system is then split up into the autonomic and, and somatic nervous systems. In the autonomic nervous system, we branch out again into two separate systems. One is the sympathetic nervous system and one is the parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic is active when the body is stressed. So, for example, it is responsible for part of the fight or flight response. And so for our example, because we're looking at heart rate, that part of the nervous system is going to be responsible for increasing heart rate. Parasympathetic nervous system then does the opposite. OK, so sympathetic and the para is the opposite. So this is active when the body is at rest and calm. OK, so the parasympathetic nervous system works to slow things down. And in this case, in our example, it's going to decrease heart rate. So if our stimulus is that the stretch receptors or the baroreceptors have detected high blood pressure, then the impulses sent to the medulla are going to say we need to reduce the heart rate. And then the medulla is going to respond with after it's coordinated this response by sending parasympathetic nerve impulses to release noradrenaline at the sinoatrial node that's in the right atrium. And as we said, they'll be using the parasympathetic nerve or the vagus nerve to do this. And that's going to release that inhibitory neurotransmitter noradrenaline, which is going to decrease the frequency of impulses from the sinoatrial node. And then that's going to decrease the frequency of impulses going to the AVN or the atrioventricular node. And so they're going to decrease the heart rate.
Okay, so if we think about the opposite then, low blood pressure happens, so that's detected again by the receptors. The impulses are sent to the medulla, again, this time saying to increase the heart rate. And then we have the same response, so the medulla is going to use the sympathetic nerve this time to send impulses and release acetylcholine at the sinoatrial node in the right atrium. And because it's releasing acetylcholine, that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it's going to be increasing the frequency of impulses, leaving the sinoatrial node. And therefore, we're going to increase the frequency of impulses going to the atrioventricular node. And therefore, we're going to increase heart rate. Why is this important? Why is it useful? Well, it's useful because it's going to prevent things like fainting. So if your blood pressure suddenly drops, then you're you wouldn't get be getting enough oxygen to your brain and that's obviously a bad thing and can cause you to pass out or faint and so in order to remedy this we can increase our heart rate in order to try and prevent that from happening. Most of the time this is going to happen when you've got exercise occurring because you've got increased rates of respiration which means we need more oxygen going to our muscles and we've got more carbon dioxide being produced that needs to be removed. So it could be building up and causing that carbonic acid to increase, which will lower the pH. Or obviously we've got low oxygen levels because a lot of it's being used up. So if that is detected by these chemoreceptors, then we're going to send impulses again to the medulla oblongata to increase the heart rate. The medulla is going to use the sympathetic nerve to send impulses and release acetylcholine again at the sinoatrial node in the right atrium. Again, we're using acetylcholine, so that's an excitatory neurotransmitter, which is why we're sp it results in the speeding up of the impulses. And again, we're saying, so the sinoatrial node is gonna increase the frequency of impulses that are sent to the AVN, and therefore we increase heart rate. We increase heart rate, we increase blood flow to the lungs, which means, Blood oxygen levels can increase, but also it helps to remove the excess carbon dioxide. So this is a slightly different picture of a neuron. We can see the cell body in a bit more detail. They have lots of mitochondria and lots of ribosomes because they do a lot of active transport and movement of ions. So obviously the active transport, the sodium potassium pump needs ATP to be able to carry out that active transport. The membrane then is adapted because the cell membrane around the cell body and all along the axon is going to have lots of ion channels as well. And they're very long, so they've got this long, stretched out, thin axon, and we'll see they need that to carry impulses over long distances. This diagram has the myelin sheath on the axon, and so these are special cells or special sections made up of cells and they actually insulate the axon. So about a third of all peripheral neurons are myelinated. Myelin is just made up of layers of highly lipid rich membrane that is released from these cells called Schwann cells. And they, I've got an example at the top, so they kind of wrap around, they produce the myelin and it wraps around, spirals around this axon in layers. And so then we get layers and layers and layers of that membrane built up and it wraps tightly around the axon. And what it does is it actually insulates the membrane. So that means it acts like an electrical insulator. So there are gaps between these areas of myelin sheath or between these Schwann cells. And they are called the nodes of Ranvier. And that's obviously named after a French person who discovered it. And these gaps are important because it's where action potentials actually occur. Because if the Schwann cells are insulating, that means there's no iron movement where they are covering the axon. So no sodium ions can move in or out, and so therefore we've got no depolarization. So depolarization can only happen at the gaps at the nodes of Ranvier where there's a concentration of sodium ion channels. And so that allows the impulse to actually travel quite fast along the neuron. And these are kind of adaptations to increasing the speed of impulses along the neuron. Okay, so this is an action potential graph and we need to make sure we can describe what's happening at each point and explain what's happening at each point as well. So at point one, when we see the membrane potential start to rise above resting potential, it's because a stimulus has been detected. So the sodium ion channels are going to open and the membranes can become more permeable to sodium. So the sodium ions will start to diffuse into the axon and into the neuron and so that's going to start making our membrane potential less negative or more positive whichever way around you want to say it then we get to part two so if that generator potential so that 
influx of sodium ions that causes our membrane potential to become slightly less negative or more positive is large enough and hits that threshold level of about minus 55 millivolts, then we've reached a point where we can make an action potential or trigger an action potential because we've hit that threshold. And that's because what happens if we get to that voltage of about minus 55, as I said, the voltage gated sodium channels are going to open. So the sodium ion channels that are triggered to open when a certain voltage is reached, so in this case, minus 55, they will open. And so more sodium ions are going to rush into the cell, into the neuron, and that's going to cause us to trigger depolarization where we get rapidly more positive inside the cell. So our membrane potential has got all the way up to about almost plus 40 millivolts now. So part three is where we then transition from depolarization to repolarization. So remember every action potential will hit the same level. So we'll hit the same about plus 40 millivolts and then the sodium ion channels are gonna close and the potassium channels are going to open. And this allows us to make the membrane impermeable to sodium ions and more permeable to the potassium ions. So they will diffuse out down their concentration gradient and allow us to bring that membrane potential back down, more negative, back down to the resting potential. Now, we have something called hyperpolarization. So you can see here at point four, our membrane potential actually dips below resting potential. It goes a bit more negative than we would expect. And that's um, because the potassium channels close but they tend to close quite slowly and so what happens is too many potassium ions diffuse out of the cell so the membrane becomes a bit more negative than resting potential because we've lost too many too many positive ions and so we go into what's called hyperpolarization so we go the opposite way to depolarization and that's okay it can be fixed and, it, and it's quite normal and so that kind of delay in going past resting potential and coming back up to resting potential is uh, a good thing and it's partly what helps us to stop more action potentials from happening too quickly after one is finished. And all of that that we've sort of looked at from about 0.3 all the way to 0.4, so between that four to six millisecond time limit, that's what we call the refractory period. So this idea that sodium ion channels are closed and we have this time delay before another action potential can start because another one cannot be triggered in this time window because the sodium ion channels are closed, because we've got hyperpolarization happening. It allows us to kind of create a separation between action potentials. So then we get back to point five. So we've returned then our membrane potential is returned to resting potential. So the sodium ion channels are closed, the potassium channels are open, and the sodium potassium pump is doing its job and working to maintain that approximately minus 65 millivolt resting potential by making sure that more positive ions are going out. So three sodium ions for every two potassium in, and that keeps us in that nice negative resting potential that we need. Okay, you need to be able to talk about a wave of depolarization and how that act, one action potential isn't going to create a response. You need to create multiple action potentials that move along the axon of the neuron as a wave. So the stimulus gets detected at one end of the neuron, and then we have to change from resting potential, which will be occurring across the whole of the axon. And we have to create this wave of depolarization where we kind of a wave of action potentials that move along the axon body away from the stimulus. So once an action potential is triggered, those sodium ions that are diffusing in because of that action potential and that leads to that action potential being created, once those sodium ion channels are closed, they are going to diffuse down the concentration gradient along the axon. And in this case, it's gonna to be to the right. This is because they cannot diffuse back to the left because once an action potential has happened, we have that, what we call, we've just talked about the refractory period. We have that repolarization stage where the sodium ion channels are closed. And so we can't go backwards. So they will diffuse to the right and then they move along. And because they diffuse to the right, they start to trigger the action potential along the neuron and the next section. So they start to depolarize it, they cause a generator potential, which reaches the threshold potential, and then more sodium ion channels open again, more sodium floods in, and we get an action potential. And so this refractory period of time is where an action potential can't be triggered because the sodium ion channels are closed and it acts as this time delay to make sure that we only move this wave of depolarization in one direction away from the stimulus and towards the other end of the neuron. 
Okay, so there are a couple of factors that can affect the speed of this impulse conduction. The action potentials can only happen at the nodes of Ramvier in a myelinated neuron. So we have an action potential at where a node is, the ions will have to diffuse through the inside and then another action potential will happen at that node, diffuse across, another action potential will happen at that node, the ions diffuse across inside, underneath the Schwann cell, and then we get another action potential in each node. This is known as saltatory conduction, and it's very, very fast. So because you're only having to have few action potentials happening at each node, you're not having to have a wave of action potentials moving along every single little piece of the neuron membrane as you go. The second is axon diameter. So literally the diameter, how wide is the axon of this neuron? So larger diameters, action potentials travel faster because there's less resistance to the flow of ions. So ions can reach parts of the membrane faster and depolarize them faster and cause a continuous wave of action potentials if you've got a wider axon diameter, which is great and very helpful. So that's one thing that can affect the speed of transmission is how wide the axon is. And then lastly, temperature. Ions are moving in order for this signal to be transmitted. We're relying on diffusion as well as active transport and those things are going to happen faster because the ions are going to be able to move faster at higher temperatures because they have more kinetic energy. So that increases the speed. However, same with anything to do with temperature and proteins, if we get to 40 degrees or above, then the protein channels are going to start to denature and that's obviously going to decrease the speed of transmission. So synapse is just the term we use for the junction between two neurons or a neuron and an effector. We have our axon, and so that would be the presynaptic neuron. It contains the vesicles of neurotransmitter. So imagine our impulse is coming down the axon here and it's reaching the presynaptic neuron. The synapse is the gap in the middle. So our postsynaptic neuron has the receptors for the neurotransmitter on it. Those receptors are actually on sodium ion channels. You can see there where the orange dots are attaching to the top of the sodium ion channel and that's where the receptors are. So the receptors aren't on the membrane and then the sodium ion channels are separate, they are one and the same. So the actual gap between the pre and post synaptic neurons or the membrane edges is called the synaptic cleft. On the pre synaptic neuron we have calcium ion channels. They are voltage gated channels which means they respond to changes in membrane potential. Whereas the sodium ion channels are ligand gated, the presynaptic bulb, there'll be lots of mitochondria in there and because we're going to need to make these vesicles full of neurotransmitter we need a large smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What's important here and it will come up in questions is they will ask you to explain how the structure of a synapse allows one-way transmission and it's to do with the fact that only the presynaptic contains the neurotransmitter and only the postsynaptic contains the receptors. So this is going to be important in a question where it says how does the how does it ensure one-way transmission so how do we know that it'll always go in the direction we've said so this way and how would we know it wouldn't go back? Well that's because if you can only make neurotransmitter one side and you only have the receptors the other side, if the neurotransmitter diffuses this way, it doesn't matter, there's no receptors there, so nothing's going to happen. So only if the diffusion of the neurotransmitter happens in this direction will it find a receptor and therefore cause an impulse and it'll only cause an impulse to be generated in this neuron, the postsynaptic one, not the presynaptic one. First step is that an action potential must arrive at the presynaptic bulb and that causes depolarization of the membrane in this part of the neuron. The change, the depolarization caused by that action potential arriving causes the voltage gated calcium ion channels to open and therefore calcium ion channels diffuse in to the presynaptic bulb. So this influx of calcium ions we say influx, that just means lots of them coming in at once, causes the vesicles that are sat there ready to go containing the acetylcholine to move and fuse with the presynaptic membrane. So they're going to move down to the edge of the membrane that is opposite the postsynaptic membrane. They're going to fuse and release their neurotransmitter, which is obviously a form of exocytosis. And this requires ATP. 
So the acetylcholine, I've used ACH here as an abbreviation. The acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft by exocytosis, as we said. That will be one of the processes that requires ATP here. The acetylcholine then diffuses across the cleft. So up until this point, we've had ions moving in this electrical signal. When we get to the synapse, we now have a chemical diffusing across a gap. And that is a bit slower. It can take a little bit longer. So that diffusion, the point where we have to wait for the chemical to diffuse across the gap and to bind to the receptors, is the only sort of part of this that causes a slight delay in the transmitting of the response between the two neurons. Okay, so once that acetylcholine is diffused across the gap, it's going to bind to the receptor sites that are on the sodium ion channels on the postsynaptic membrane, and it causes them to open. So previously, we had the change in voltage or potential difference because of the membrane potential changing that opened the calcium channels. Now we are having a receptor binding to that chemical binding to a receptor on the ion channels that's causing it to open. Once those channels are obviously open, same thing as before, we said there's an influx of ions, so sodium ions can now enter the postsynaptic neuron and therefore cause depolarization, just like it does when we talk about an action potential being generated along the rest of the neuron body. Once we've got sodium ions moving in, if that causes the threshold potential to be reached, if we depolarize the membrane enough, then an action potential will then be triggered and it will move along the neuron keep being this influx of sodium ions until that neurotransmitter is removed from the synaptic cleft. There is an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase found on the membranes in and around the synaptic cleft. And so what that does is it actually breaks down acetylcholine and then the two products are then reabsorbed by the presynaptic neuron and then they can be used to remake acetylcholine and stored in those vesicles again. So it breaks it down into ethanoic acid and choline, or acetic acid and choline, and those two are then actively transported back in to the presynaptic neuron, and what it'll do is it basically rejoins them back again to make acetylcholine and stores it in the vesicle. So it gets recycled, but most importantly, it gets removed, so there isn't this build-up of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Spatial summation, as it suggests, is to do with physical space. So in this case there are three different synapses because we've got three neurons junctioning onto one other neuron, so similar to what we were talking about with the rods. So this allows weak stimuli signals to be detected, so it's where two or more presynaptic neurons release a small amount of neurotransmitter at the same time onto the same postsynaptic neuron. So we've got three presynaptic neurons, they're all junctioning onto one postsynaptic neuron, and so they will all release neurotransmitter, a small amount if their signals are weak, but there'll be enough neurotransmitter then in the synaptic cleft to trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So with temporal summation, temporal meaning time, so we have this idea that actually we've only got one presynaptic and one postsynaptic neuron, but this is where larger or intense stimuli can be detected. So it's where two or more nerve impulses or action potentials arrive in quick succession from the same presynaptic neuron. So it's about an increased frequency of action potentials coming down one presynaptic neuron. So the larger or more intense the stimulus, the greater the frequency of action potentials. So that means more neurotransmitters will be released within a short time of each other. So each impulse will release neurotransmitter and it builds up, builds up, builds up in the synaptic cleft. And it makes it much more likely that then an action potential will be generated straight away in the postsynaptic neuron. So we've got spatial, more than one presynaptic neuron junctioning onto one postsynaptic neuron. And then we have temporal, which is about the frequency of those potentials coming down and therefore increasing the strength of the signal and increasing the chances of an action potential. So we're going to look at the neuromuscular junction, which is basically the synapse between a motor neuron and a muscle fiber. So we're going to look at how we get that action potential coming from the motor neuron, how it crosses that junction, the gap between the neuron and the muscle fiber, and then how that starts to lead to a contraction. So the synapse is actually between the end of a neuron, so the synaptic um, end, and the sarcolemma of the muscle fibre. So that is here.
and you can see I've got sort of multiple axon branches coming out with one muscle fiber. And you can kind of see all of the structures we looked at in the last video. So we've got the sarcolemma around the outside. We've got the sarcophasic reticulum in, in sort of blue green covering around the outside of the myofibril. And then we have those T tubules that we spoke about, which is the infolding of this sarcolemma membrane to make these tubes that go all the way down and around the myofibril. So this time, instead of initiating another action potential, as if it would if it was a synapse with another neuron, what actually happens is the signal passes across the synapse and it causes the muscle fibre to contract. So that's the aim here. We're not aiming to cause another action potential, we're aiming to cause a contraction. Okay, so we've got kind of a closer up picture of an axon terminal, kind of the actual neuromuscular junction now, which looks sort of similar to what we've seen when we looked at the synapse diagram previously. And we're kind of comparing this to a cholinogenic synapse. Remember, that's one that uses acetylcholine. And initially, the kind of first stages are exactly the same. So an action potential arrives at the uh, part of the axon just above the synapse in the presynaptic neuron and it causes the change in membrane potential and that causes the influx of calcium ions to come into the presynaptic neuron which causes the release of the acetylcholine that's in those vesicles and they fuse with the edge of the membrane of the presynaptic neuron and release their contents by exocytosis into the synaptic cleft. So all of that is exactly the same as how we described an action potential arriving at cholinogenic synapse. It's just what happens afterwards. So we're just mostly looking at the differences in the postsynaptic membrane and what happens there because we've not just got another neuron and it's a little bit more complicated. So in the same way as before, the acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and it's going to bind to receptors. But this time you'll notice there are folds in the sarcolemma. So it's not just like a smooth, straight surface. There's lots of folds and all of the receptors are within kind of the membrane on those folds. This opens sodium channel, sodium ion channels in the sarcolemma. So that part is also the same, except obviously those sodium ion channels are in the sarcolemma this time, not in the membrane. And then the sodium ions enter the sarcolemma and depolarize it. So it does depolarize the membrane in the same way, but instead of sort of moving through and down kind of a narrow axon, what actually happens is the wave of depolarization spreads along the sarcolemma. So it goes along the sarcolemma and then it goes down the T-tubules to get to sort of the outside of that muscle fiber. And you can see that the T-tubules then come into contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum and you can see the calcium ions there. So that is where we're trying to take that change in membrane potential and that depolarization of the sarcoplasm then around the muscle fiber and around the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to trigger the release of those calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which are going to move down into the myofibril. And that is what will trigger the muscle contraction. So mostly it's the same as what we've looked at before with the synapse, but we have to think about what we're, words we're using the language. So we're talking about the sarcolemma instead of talking about the postsynaptic membrane. And we're talking about the wave of depolarization spreading along the sarcolemma and then down the T-tubules into the muscle fiber and then triggering the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of that is new and different from when we looked at just the normal, regular synapse. Looking at muscle structure, you've got your muscle, which is your actual big skeletal muscle. And then that is split up into muscle fibers. And these muscle fibers are sort of long cells or bundles of long cells that have all been joined together. And the cells are effectively very, very specialized. And they have all joined together end to end to create these really long muscle fibers. And then within those, they have organelles that are, again, very specialized called myofibrils. So the idea of a, a smaller, narrower fiber inside the bigger muscle fiber. This is a section of a muscle fiber. At the top here, we have the synapse with the motor neuron, which is sometimes also called the neuromuscular junction. This is one of the points where obviously the axon terminal, so we've got the axon of the motor neuron actually joins to the muscle fiber. So it's how we get that kind of signal from the electrical impulse crossing over into the muscle fiber. We have lots of mitochondria. And they are inside the muscle fiber, inside the cell, just the same as they would be in a normal cell. But obviously we need lots of them in this case because they're going to provide the ATP that we need for muscle contraction. 
they are sat in and around the sarcoplasm, which is basically the same as the cytoplasm. The sarcolemma, again, sarco, that prefix, it's just the cell membrane, goes around this specialised muscle cell. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, its role is very important with muscle contraction because it stores and releases the calcium ions that we need in order to do muscle contraction. The T tubule is the T is short for transverse, so it's the transverse tubules. They are in folds in the membrane that are tubes of membrane that come down into the cell and they bring or allow the transmission of that impulse down into the muscle fibre. So they allow or allow the travel of the depolarization down into and close to the myofibril. So they allow the, the passing through of that electrical impulse through the muscle cell. And then lastly, we have the myofibril. So this is an organelle in its right. It is a type of sort of even smaller fiber, but there's many of these within one muscle fiber. They are cylindrical, long organelles, and they're highly specialized and they're made up or they contain the proteins actin and myosin, which are going to allow the whole of this muscle fiber and therefore the whole muscle to contract. They are the contractual units of the muscle. So these myofibrils are split into repeating sections, which are known as sarcomeres. And you can see there's one of these sections up here. And the myofibril has repeating units of these called sarcomeres. And we need to also know the structure of that as well. We've got the Z discs. They denote the ends of the sarcomere. So one sarcomere goes from Z disc to Z disc. Then we have this section called the I band, sometimes called the light band, because it contains only actin. And you have one of those either side, obviously. And so then in the middle, where you can see the myosin and the actin overlap, this is known as the A band. It's also known as the dark band. So you've got the dark A bands and you've got the light I bands. And obviously they repeat. So it goes light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. That gives you that stripy or striated pattern that gives this muscle this kind of striped appearance. So within the A band, so although this band is dark, there is a slightly lighter area in the middle called the H zone. That is where obviously you can see here there's no actin, it's just myosin. So that means it's, although it's still darker than the I band, it's slightly lighter or a lighter patch in the middle of the A band because there's only myosin present there. And then in the middle, you can see these orange kind of sections here sort of denoting where the middle of the, uh, the myosin filament is. That is sort of a dark line in the middle of the H zone, which is known as the M line. It just denotes the middle of the centre of the sarcomere. So there are actually two types of skeletal muscle fibre as well. So there's slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibres. Different muscles will have different proportions of slow twitch and fast twitch fibres, depending on what those muscles are used for. The slow twitch fibres are darker in colour and they're darker red because they contain more myoglobin. And myoglobin is a protein that enables the muscle to store or bind to oxygen. The fast twitch fibre, they are lighter in colour and they don't have as much myoglobin. They have less myoglobin and instead they have more glycogen because they are going to be predominantly doing anaerobic respiration. The slow twitch fibres, they contract slowly, but they are slow to fatigue or get tired. The fast twitch fibres, do what they say on the tin, they are fast, so they are for fast, rapid, quick contractions, but they can get tired very quickly. The slow twitch fibres, because they contract slowly, but they don't get tired over a long period of time, they're used for long distance running or things like the muscles in your back that are used to help you maintain posture for you to stand upright. Fast twitch fibres are for short bursts of speed or power, so sprinting, moving your eyes really quickly, the pupil reactions, for example, sharp movements, that's what we need the fast twitch fibres for. So we need the power quickly, but we're not going to be doing this movement repeatedly over a long period of time, or if you do, it starts to hurt or get cramped because the muscle becomes fatigued. The reason the slow twitch fibres are good and designed for their purpose is because they release energy slowly using aerobic respiration. But as long as there's enough oxygen to maintain that, obviously they can keep doing that over a long period of time. The opposite is then true for fast twitch. They use anaerobic respiration because that releases energy faster. Think about respiration. Anaerobic respiration is just going through the process of glycolysis. It's not going through the whole of the aerobic respiration equations. So it's just quicker and faster to just do glycolysis and just release that small amount of ATP. But fast 
But obviously, over a period of time, we're going to build up more of that lactic acid, which is going to cause us to get fatigued. So in order to do their job, the slow twitch muscle fibers, remember, these are specialized cells. They have lots of mitochondria to provide the ATP we need for doing the contractions over time and also lots of blood vessels to reduce the diffusion distance for gas exchange. So making sure that we've got that good blood supply, shortening that diffusion distance, maintaining that concentration gradient to make sure we've got a constant supply of oxygen to allow us to do the aerobic respiration. In the fast twitch fibres, they do not need as many mitochondria or blood vessels because they're doing anaerobic respiration, which occurs in the cytoplasm, or in this case, the sarcoplasm, and not in mitochondria. And also there's therefore less oxygen needed as well. We don't need as many mitochondria, but they need some because they will need to carry out other energy requiring processes, but they are not carrying out the majority of their respiration aerobically. Most of it is anaerobic. We need to look at how the sarcomere shortens and what we can tell from the structures how it looks once it's contracted. The actin filaments slide over like this. They get pulled towards the middle and slide over. Both sides would move at the same time if we're looking at the real thing. So we need to be able to, once that has happened, once that contraction has happened and those actin filaments have slid over, how can we tell that this is a contracted sarcomere? So the first thing is to look at the eye bands. So the eye bands have become narrower. Remember, that's the light band. That's the region that just contains the actin. And it would be either side of the Z disc and also the H zone. That has also become narrower. So that zone in the middle that was just myosin only has now shrunk very, very small because the actin has moved over it. So we've got narrower eye bands and a narrower H zone that have been caused by the actin sliding over the myosin. Next, we need to look at the Z discs. So the Z discs have got closer together. So as that actin has been pulled across the myosin to the middle, the Z discs, which is the sort of the binding point, the joining point for the ends of those actin molecules, has been pulled as well. So the Z discs are now closer together. So the distance between them has got shorter. The, the whole sarcomere has shortened and we can show that. And then lastly, we need to look at the A band. So the A band is the thing that does not change. It does not get smaller. It doesn't get bigger. It stays exactly the same. And that's because the A band is where the myosin is. It's made mostly of where the myosin and the actin overlap. And although the actin have moved, the myosin has not moved. So where the actin and myosin are crossing over is staying the same. So the A band does not change because the myosin does not move in this sliding filament theory. Only the actin slides over the myosin. So as I said, this happens in every sarcomere the whole length of a myofibril. So every single sarcomere contracts at the same time, the actin is pulled inwards, and so the whole of the myofibril will contract because all of its sarcomeres have contracted, and that happens in every myofibril, and so that happens in every muscle fibre, which then causes the whole muscle to contract. And then the same thing happens when it relaxes, so when they relax and they move back to their relaxed state, then we're going to get the whole muscle relaxing as well, because all the sarcomeres in that all of the myofibrils will also relax. Okay, so this is the actual muscle contraction process. And you might see it look very similar in diagrams in textbooks, or you might see it as a diagram in a question. And we just need to be able to talk through what's happening in these stages. And then maybe be able to say what might happen if one of these stages was stopped or couldn't progress. So the first things to think about is that the calcium ions are going to diffuse into the myofibril from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as we just said, and they will have been triggered by that depolarization of the sarcolemma and the tubules and cause that release. Then the calcium ions are going to bind and cause the tropomyosin to move, exposing the binding sites on the actin. So they're going to bind there, they're going to move cause a sort of a shape change, which is going to expose those binding sites. That allows the myosin heads on the myosin filaments above and below are going to be able to attach to those binding sites and form what we call an actin myosin cross bridge. Sometimes you can just refer to it as a cross bridge. Energy that's been stored in the head, and we'll say how that's happened in a second. So you could always start by saying there is energy stored in the head if you want to. But that energy that's stored in the head, you'll see we've got ADP and PI there, is used to bend the head. OK, like we said, it has that ability to move on that hinge shape and it pulls the actin filament along. OK, and that ADP and PI are then released. This movement is known 
as the power stroke and it pulls the actin filament along the top of the myosin. A new ATP molecule comes because we've released our ADP and PI that we've clearly are left over from um, ATP hydrolysis from before. So now a new ATP molecule is going to attach to the myosin head and that causes it to detach from the actin binding site. So the joining or the binding of ATP to the myosin head causes the head to detach from the actin. So the cross bridge is broken. The hydrolysis of that ATP to ADP and PI by ATP as enzyme or however you refer to this enzyme in your spec, but ATP as enzyme is, is normally good enough, provides the energy needed to recock the myosin head. That means to kind of push it back down, ready to go again. It's already detached, but it needs to lay back down and it's stored the energy then like a spring being pulled back. Okay, it's ready to come back up and move back up and bind to the binding site. So it's gone back to its original position and it's got that spring stored energy in the form of ADP and PI kind of stored there, ready to go again. And this can go round and round and round in cycles. Okay, so speaking of energy and ATP, each muscle fibre only contains about enough ATP to allow for about one to two seconds of contraction, which obviously isn't very long, especially if you're doing running, long distance running or anything that requires you to move for quite a long time. So during the exercise, the muscles must have a constant supply, which can come from a couple of different places. Obviously, the main one, aerobic respiration. So most ATP in muscles is generated via oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria of the muscle cells. I remember these are the muscle fibers. We were talking about the fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. So specifically slow twitch muscle fibers are going to be doing a lot of aerobic respiration. So that is where their ATP is going to come from. Fast twitch fibers, so anaerobic respiration is going to be happening as well. So ATP can be made readily by glycolysis in the sarcoplasm. So remember, that's not happening in the mitochondria. That's why those fast twitch fibers don't really have as many mitochondria. This is useful for the short periods of intense exercise. So it will get you enough ATP to give you enough of a power boost for a short period of time. But the muscles are going to tire after a while because the pyruvate is being fermented to lactate or lactic acid, which builds up. And that's going to cause your muscles to get tired an ache and that's going to be a problem so you're only able to do that for a short amount of time. There is another store um, of a chemical called phosphocreatine and it is stored in muscle cells because it can rapidly provide phosphate which helps to produce ATP so ADB plus the phosphocreatine gives us ATP plus a chemical called creatine so it basically just separates the phosphate group from the creatine in this molecule. The phosphocreatine is going to run out after a few seconds, so it's only used for short bursts of vigorous exercise if you really need it. So that's where we get that idea of only having a few seconds of contraction because we have this phosphocreatine store. It's anaerobic, it doesn't require any oxygen, it doesn't form any lactate, and creatine can be broken down into creatinine and removed from the blood by the kidneys. Okay, so it's important for the body con to control several factors to maintain homeostasis, and these are all controlled by negative feedback mechanisms. We're going to look at negative feedback um, in a minute, but briefly we need to think about some examples of things that the body controls through homeostasis and why it's important that it is controlled. So the main one or an easy one that you probably would have learned about potentially already at GCSE and will know the reasons why is your body temperature. So too high. Enzymes can denature because obviously bonds can be broken in the tertiary structure that's holding the shape together. So therefore, the substrate will no longer fit into the active site and we can't have chemical reactions. And that's obviously a problem because chemical reactions control a lot of our body processes, things like respiration. Too low is also bad as well, though. So reactions will slow down when the temperature is too low because there's just not enough kinetic energy for the particles moving around for us to actually have the energy to complete those reactions. And that's also a bad thing as well. So anything where our reactions will be too slow or the enzymes controlling the reactions are going to denature is going to slow down processes in the body and prevent life cycles. So your optimum is about 37 degrees C. Obviously, there is some leeway here it can be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on age and all sorts of things, whether you are ill. But if it gets past a certain temperature, it becomes dangerous. Either way, you can either have a really high dangerous fever or be hypothermic. The next one is the pH of blood. 
So mostly we're talking about blood, blood plasma here, tissue fluid, that pH. And the optimum is about 7.35 to 7.45. If it deviates too far from this, this can be an issue because it can affect enzymes again. So we've got um, this idea of ionic bonding being disrupted by OH minus ions or H plus ions in solution, which is obviously what pH is measured by. And so they can be denatured. Those ionic bonds can be disrupted. Same thing as temperature. Tertiary structure is disrupted. The shape no longer fits with the substrate. There is no reaction occurring. So it's for similar reasons to temperature, but our blood pH also needs to be controlled. So that's thinking of things like the carbonic acid that dissolves if um, there's too much carbon dioxide present, if we're not getting rid of it from the body properly. That's the exact sort of one of the examples we talked about of um, the pH kind of changing in blood. So another factor, hopefully, again, you'll be familiar with this from GCSE, is your blood glucose levels. We obviously, it's important that we have enough glucose in the blood that we have it there to be transported for various processes, specifically respiration. But also, the presence of glucose in the blood actually affects water potential. If you think about it, it's a dissolved substance. It makes a solution. So if there's too high blood glucose levels, so you've got a lot of glucose dissolved in your blood plasma, the water potential of your blood will be lower. And if you've got too little blood glucose and other dissolved substances in the blood, then your blood water potential can be really high. And that's something that needs to be controlled because the cells around it that's going to cause osmotic effects. So blood glucose level is important to control for the reason that we need the, enough glucose to be circulating around in order to be able to carry out processes that require uh, glucose, such as respiration. But also we need to think about how much there is in the blood because that's going to sort of be determined our water potential which of our plasma and our tissue fluid around our cells, which can affect the cells. Which brings us on to the final one, which is blood water content. So the water content, again, of blood and of the tissue fluid, the water potential of those is very important. We need to maintain it because if we don't have it within a sort of an isotonic range for our cells cytoplasm, then it's going to cause osmotic effects of the cells can cause shrinking, bursting, obviously, to the extremes. So being able to make sure that the water potential stays within a certain range so that it is isotonic to our cells is very important. We also need water for some reactions, so it's important for metabolism of cells so that they can keep going and carrying out the reactions that require water. Thinking about condensation and hydrolysis reactions, if we don't have enough water present, then hydrolysis reactions are not going to be able to be carried out as efficiently. And so all of this is important. And so osmoregulation, the regulation of the um, water potential of the body is very important. And Okay, so we're going to look at temperature control briefly, and then we're going to go into a lot more detail on the other factors we've talked about. So the hypothalamus in the brain is the area that contains the thermoregulatory centre, and it contains receptors that are sensitive to temperature of the blood. So that's where our receptors are. It also receives nervous impulses from thermoreceptors that you have in your skin, and then it sends impulses. So the hypothalamus has the receptors, but also acts as the coordinator here and it sends the impulses along motor neurons to various effectors. So the, this time we're using nerve signals, we're using the nervous system to control temperature, we're not using hormones. So one of the effectors are the piloerector muscles in your skin, which are responsible for raising and lowering your skin hairs. So if you are too cold, then, and the hypothalamus detects this, electrical impulses, action potentials are sent down motor neurons to these muscles, and they are supposed to contract and as they contract they will pull up your hairs to stand up straight this is when you have goosebumps and all your hairs stand on end that's what this is when you're cold and that raising of the hairs traps a load of air that is able to then insulate you around that layer of skin it is obviously left over from when we had more hair on our bodies um, because the hair we actually have doesn't actually make that much of a difference but um, you see this in other mammals as well um, they do it in order to kind of give themselves that insulating layer. And obviously it works better if you have way more body hair. If you are too hot, then the impulse is sent do the opposite. They tell those muscles to relax. And so therefore the hairs are lowered because we don't need to have that insulating layer of air anymore. The sweat glands also in your skin 
So this is a gland that's an effect of this time instead of a muscle, but they will be stimulated by the nervous system again to produce more sweat when you are hot so that you can lose heat energy by evaporating that sweat, the liquid of sweat off your skin um, and through evaporation. So we lose heat energy that way and it just allows us to cool down. Skeletal muscles, so mostly this is your arms and your legs, but this has potentially also happened in other parts of your body if you've been really, really cold. Um, when you are really, really cold, your hypothalamus is going to stimulate your muscles to contract rapidly. So again, motor neuron signals will cause your muscles to contract rapidly. Contraction is going to generate heat energy because the contraction requires energy from respiration. And so we release some heat through that process because we should hopefully know that respiration releases some heat energy and that helps us to warm up basically. And so that kind of quick rapid contraction is basically a way of generating heat energy through increased rate of respiration. Your smooth muscle as well, and we looked um, briefly at smooth muscles and the fact that we have layers of smooth muscle in our blood vessels. So these, as we said, are um, can be under control of the nervous system and they can be caused to contract or relax. And this is controlled, called vasoconstriction when they contract. And that happens when you are cold or vasodilation, which means obviously to relax and dilate that, which happens when you are too warm. Now, the reason they do this is because if you vasoconstrict those blood vessels, then less blood is able to flow through them. The volume of blood flowing through them is reduced. So we tend to do that for blood vessels near the skin and at the extremities. So fingers, toes, nose, ears, which is why they can become very, very cold. And some people have various syndromes where actually the, the lack of blood flow to those areas in the cold makes their hands and things actually go blue and can be very, very painful. Then the opposite is true when you get really hot and really sweaty. And if you do loads of exercise, sometimes you'll find out you have a very red face. And that's because when vasodilation happens, we're widening those blood vessels. So more blood is flowing through those capillaries that are close to the skin and also through the extremities to try and lose that heat energy. Same with the um, vasoconstriction. We're doing the opposite by reducing the blood flow. That nice warm blood stays closer inside the body and we keep our blood like the warm blood flowing around the kind of internal organs and we don't want it flowing through the the parts of the skin that are going to get the most cold so we don't lose that precious heat energy negative feedback is a continuous cycle that goes on in the body in various places in various processes if a factor in the internal environment increases or decreases above or below the optimum level then changes will take place to restore the conditions to that optimum so, for example, something, a condition increases above the optimum level, so it moves away from the optimum level as an increase. That increase is going to be detected by receptors. As we said, it's going to be the same mechanism that we looked at with nerves, where we've got a receptor, a coordinator, an effector, and a response. The receptors send signals to the effector, or they will send signals to a coordinator, which sends signals to an effector. Then the effector is going to bring about a change. It's going to react in some way that brings about a change to decrease that condition back down towards the optimum. And then the condition returns towards the optimum level and starts to decrease. Now, this is exactly the same thing as I said, it's a cycle. So that um, factor is gonna be decreasing towards the optimum. It might then decrease past the optimum and carry on going, or it could decrease for another reason at another time. So it decreases below the optimum, that decrease is detected by receptors again, which send signals to the effector or will send signals to a coordinator, which sends signals to the effector. And then the effectors are stimulated and they cause the change, which hopefully will return, start to return the factor back to the optimum level. And again, the condition increases and goes back towards the optimum. And this can go up and down and up and down and up and down constantly. It is a continuous cycle to make sure that whatever the condition is, it is maintained within the limits that are acceptable for the body. Okay, so we're going to look at controlling blood glucose concentration. So why is it important though that we keep our blood glucose level within this range? Well, if it drops too low, then cells might not have enough glucose for respiration and they may not be able to function normally. Brain cells are particularly sensitive to this. Your brain actually needs quite a lot of glucose to function. 
it needs requires a lot of energy. So if your blood glucose levels drop, similar to if your blood oxygen levels drop, then your brain is very particularly affected. If blood glucose levels are too high, it can change the water potential and then have osmotic effects. So cause water to start moving in and out of cells if the blood plasma and the tissue fluid aren't isotonic to your cell cytoplasm. Let's have a think about how we're going to control this then. So the blood glucose concentration is going to be controlled by the parts of the endocrine system. So it's to do with hormones and we're using glands to be able to control this. So the receptors that are going to be detecting the blood glucose levels are located in regions called the islets of Langerhans, which is the endocrine tissue inside the pancreas. The signals that we're sending is hormones. So hopefully from GCSE, we should remember the hormones are insulin and glucagon, and they are both secreted by the pancreas and they'll be traveling around in the bloodstream. And then the effectors which are going to cause our blood glucose level to either increase or decrease are going to be in multiple organs and cells. So the liver, the muscle cells and fat cells are the target cells of these hormones. So we need to know how blood glucose concentration changes so that we can understand the reactions and how insulin and glucon actually cause these changes. And there's some key terminology in here that we have to know that can trip some people up. So glycogenolysis basically means the splitting of glycogen. Glycogen, O, lysis. Lysis meaning to split or burst, break. So it's basically the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. It happens in the liver. And then obviously that glucose can then be released into the blood so it can increase blood glucose levels. The next one is gluconeogenesis. Gluco meaning glucose, neo meaning new, genesis meaning to make. So making new glucose. The liver has this ability to be able to produce glucose molecules from other molecules. So converting them into glucose. Namely, it uses proteins from the muscles, it could be examples are lactate and pyruvate, and it also makes it use glycerol, which comes from fat cell. So they are both ways that blood glucose levels can be increased. How about how do we decrease our blood glucose levels? Well, the main one that blood glucose levels decreases is glycogen again, but, and the liver, but this time glucose is actually being converted into glycogen. Glucose molecules are being joined together to create glycogen, and obviously that lowers the blood glucose levels. Next one is obviously during exercise, your muscles are going to need more glucose in order to do more respiration. So they start uptaking or taking in more glucose from the blood. The other two obvious ones that I've not really mentioned yet, but hopefully this should make some sense. So fasting obviously decreases blood glucose levels. So not eating. And then obviously on the other side, eating increases your blood glucose levels. So if you eat carbohydrates and they obviously get broken down by enzymes in the digestive system and then reducing sugars, including glucose, are absorbed into the bloodstream. Every time you eat, that's going to increase your blood glucose levels. If you don't eat for a long time and you've been moving around, so you've been using up the glucose that's in your blood, then you are fasting and that will decrease your blood glucose levels until they get to a point where your body then kicks in and tries to return your blood glucose levels to the optimum. And so we're going to look at how that does that next. The endocrine tissue that's the islets of Langerhans, which are parts of the pancreas and they secrete hormones into the capillaries in response to blood glucose levels. So when your blood glucose levels are too low, it is the alpha cells that are the cells that are in, found in the islets of Langerhans, they secrete glucagon, the hormone. That is obviously then going to travel around in the bloodstream and it is going to bind to receptors on the target cells. As we said, so they have receptors for the hormones, the hormone will bind and cause various effects. So in order to increase our blood glucose levels because they're too low, glucagon binds to liver cells mostly and causes it to start converting glycogen back into glucose. So breaking down glycogen into glucose, so it activates glycogenolysis. It also activates gluconeogenesis, so that production of glucose from other sources, so namely proteins, amino acids from proteins from the muscles, and glycerol from fat cells. So they will be being sent to the liver from those cells, although we will be in the blood and be able to be absorbed by the liver in order to do gluconeogenesis. And both of those are triggered by glucagon. If the opposite happens and your blood glucose levels go too high, for example, after you've eaten a cake to make sure your blood glucose level doesn't go too high once you've absorbed all of that sugar, then we have this response. So the beta cells this time, they secrete insulin. So they will detect that this blood glucose level is too high. They will secrete insulin into the blood that will travel around the bloodstream and again, bind to receptors on target cells. And the main thing that it does for them is that it causes these cells to undergo a change 
where they have more glucose transporters in their membrane. So it increases their permeability to glucose, which means they start absorbing more glucose by facilitated diffusion. And that increases glucose uptake, which obviously removes it from the blood. The other thing it does as well, because obviously we talked about ways that we can decrease blood glucose, is that it activates in the liver the process where we take glucose and we start binding it together to make glycogen. So converting glucose into glycogen for storage. But also this is good for the liver because it, the process of it doing that keeps the concentration gradient quite steep between the liver and the blood in terms of glucose. So because when glucose enters the liver, it's being converted to glycogen straight away, that means there's always, or in this case for a short time, there's more glucose in the blood than in the liver. So it keeps that concentration gradient maintained so that glucose continues to enter the liver out of the blood and decreases that blood glucose level. So that is, in fact, the negative feedback system that controls our blood glucose levels. Some hormones are what we call non-steroid hormones. This means they have to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell membrane and rely on what we call secondary messengers to work inside the cells to amplify that original signal and cause the change to happen within the cell. Glucagon and adrenaline. Adrenaline is secreted by the adrenal glands, which are found on top of your kidney. So you have one gland on the top of each kidney and they secrete the hormone adrenaline. We're looking at both of these hormones because they trigger the activation of glycogenolysis in liver cells. And it occurs through this secondary messenger model that we've mentioned. So both adrenaline or glucagon can do this. They bind to their receptors on the cell membrane of liver cells. And these are classed as the first messengers. The adrenaline and glucagon have both been secreted as a response to low blood glucose levels in this case. And their aim is obviously to try and cause a change in the liver cells that's going to release glucose into the blood. So the first thing that happens when they bind to their receptors is that it triggers the activation of something called a G protein. So we're going to take the G protein and activate it. Normally, remember when we talk about activation, we tend to mean adding a phosphate group, um, which is something uh, one of those other uses of ATP is to be able to add a phosphate group to a molecule and it tends to activate it or increase its energy level. That activated G protein then causes a shape change in an enzyme that's bound inside the membrane called adenylcyclase. It's an enzyme, and so this conformational shape change that happens when the G protein binds to it makes it able to be activated. So it changes the shape in order for it to now accept its substrate and be able to catalyze a reaction. The adenylcyclase enzyme, when it's activated, can catalyze the conversion of ATP into something called cyclic AMP, or CAMP for short. And this is then the secondary messenger. So this activation of ATP into CAMP, the CAMP is what then goes on to cause the changes in the cell that we want to happen. So it's the secondary messenger. It passes on this signal and causes the change in the cell. So what CAMP does is it activates a protein kinase enzyme cascade. So protein kinase enzymes are a group of enzymes. And this idea of a cascade is that one enzyme is activated, which causes something to happen, which triggers another enzyme, etc. And ultimately, this leads to the breakdown of glycogen into glucose or glycogen lysis. And so therefore, we're going to release glucose into the bloodstream. So that binding of the adrenaline or the glucagon through this system has triggered a change in the cell, which has resulted in the outcome that we wanted as the effector causes the response of increasing the blood glucose level. So this is a very similar system used by a lot of hormones that have to bind to receptors. It's similar, depending on obviously the target cell, it will have different effects based on what this enzyme cascade sets off. But this is something that's quite common in cells in biology as a way of triggering an effect inside a cell from the outside by being, only being able to bind to a receptor. Diabetes is a group of conditions where blood glucose concentration can't be controlled properly. And after eating, blood glucose concentration doesn't reduce as it should, as glucose is not being absorbed. A regular blood glucose concentration of above 7.8 millimoles is considered high enough to be diabetes. We've got two blood glucose readings here after they've eaten some food. You've got a really rapid increase in blood glucose after eating the food, and then it's quite slow to reduce. So there are two types of diabetes. We need to know both, and we need to be able to explain the differences between them. So the cause of type 1 diabetes is that the beta cells do not produce insulin anymore. And this can be as a result of a genetic problem, so you can be born with it, or it can happen to you 
sometimes when you're quite young or even later in life. Effect of this, so the effect of this is that your pancreas will no longer secrete insulin at all. The consequence of this is obviously your blood glucose levels can get extremely high, especially after eating. Very high blood glucose levels are obviously quite dangerous and they can lead to a coma or even death if not treated and just left to get higher and higher. The main treatment for type 1 diabetes is insulin therapy, so injecting insulin regularly after meals and throughout the day. And normally they have to check their blood glucose levels with a test and then inject the correct amount of insulin to lower those to the correct level. Too much insulin can obviously cause them to go too low, so we don't want that either. And that can obviously have its own issues, so managing that is quite important. Long term, there are obviously the options of replacing those damaged cells in the pancreas with potentially a pancreas transplant, but this would involve taking anti-rejection medication or stem cells. Again, that can involve anti-rejection medication. And again, these are kind of really serious long term treatments. They're not regularly offered to people with type 1 diabetes. We have to know the differences. So the cause is different. In this case, the pancreas makes insulin perfectly normally. It's just that the receptors the insulin receptors on the target cells do not respond to insulin. And that doesn't mean all receptors on every target cell doesn't respond to insulin. It can be different. It depends on the cause. Often this could be caused by a genetic issue, but it could also be caused by things like fat around certain organs, meaning that the insulin receptors on those organs aren't responding. So what the effect is, is that obviously cells do not take up enough glucose. So not as much glucose is being removed from the bloodstream as a result of insulin not binding and therefore not increasing those transport proteins for glucose on the outside of the cell membrane. The consequence is just a generally higher than normal blood glucose level all the time. So it's not at the massive spike seen with no insulin being produced at all, because again, it's not every single insulin receptor in every single cell that doesn't respond here. But we get to this point where your average blood glucose level is higher than normal most of the time. So the treatment for type 2 diabetes is normally a healthy balanced diet, which can be low carbohydrate or low sugar focused and regular exercise. And the, obviously the exercise really helps because that is going to be removing that glucose from the blood to use up in respiration and to help sort of use up that excess glucose that's in the bloodstream. Because even a slight increase, but on a regular basis of blood glucose levels can have knock on effects on the kidneys, on the eyes, on all other parts of the body. There can also be the option to take glucose lowering medication if the balanced diet and the regular exercise isn't working hard enough as well. The other th last thing to note about type 2 diabetes, is obviously type 2 diabetes cannot be treated with insulin therapy because it would make no difference because they do already have insulin in their bloodstream. Their pancreas is working. It's the receptors that can't respond to it. So adding insulin would not help. Okay, so the causes and consequences of type 2 diabetes constitute like an actual health issue, a global health issue, but also in the UK. So type 2 diabetes is increasing in the UK population because it's been linked to increasing levels of obesity. So the increasing levels of obesity in the population have directly caused this increase in type 2 diabetes. That has been demonstrated. So the obesity crisis is a direct link of unhealthy diets in the population and along with a reduction in reduced exercise and activity in the population. Type 2 diabetes is a serious health problem. It can cause other risks such as heart disease, stroke, vision loss and kidney failure because all of these extra organs are having to work twice as hard. All of this, so type 2 diabetes itself, all of the associated health risks with type 2 diabetes put strain on the NHS. So health advisors would like to try and get to the root cause and try and increase awareness about obesity and its impact on things like increasing type 2 diabetes and increasing other health issues. And so trying to reduce, reduce obesity will help reduce all of these problems. There is also another sort of branch of thought, though, that as well as the health industry and the NHS trying to help promote healthier lifestyles in people, the food industry also plays a role here. If food and the kind of unhealthy diet is the source of the problem and food marketing, especially around things like junk food, it plays a role. And so we health advisors would like food industry executives to be part of this conversation and trying to help reducing the poor diets that we see as a majority of the population. Educate people that a healthy lifestyle is better and that it can reduce some 
chances of non-communicable diseases, including type 2 diabetes. And also trying to help adults and other people make their labelling clearer so that people can make healthy choices when they choose food, those kind of red, orange, green triangles. We also have to balance this with what the food companies are doing. So they have responded by making some low sugar, low salt, low fat products that you can get. So 0% fat. But the way they've done that is to use artificial sweeteners to make the food till still taste appealing. Add two centimetres cubed of Benedict's to each sample before we put in the hot water. Once I put it on, I'm going to give it a little mix for each one. Okay, so those are all my known samples, and then I have my patient one, patient two, and patient three unknown samples. So I'm going to add two centimeters cubed of Bendix to those as well. The samples have gone into the water bath, so I've used hot water from the kettle and just put those tubes in them, giving them kind of a, a shake and a mix, make sure they kind of evenly distributed through the hot water. Set the timer for about five minutes and we're just leaving them to sit in there, waiting for the timer to go off. All the tubes have gone into the same temperature of water and have gone in for the same amount of time. OK, so now we're going to move on to filtering and then actually testing these samples. So the main thing I'm going to do first is to filter these samples that we've done the Benedict test on to remove some of the precipitate. If you have a lot of precipitate, especially with the kind of very red orangey ones, it can make the solution quite cloudy and that can affect the colorimeter. So, okay, so I have my colorimeter here and I'm going to blank it or zero it or calibrate it using some Benedict's and distilled water. And this is because we want our zero to be the blue Benedict's colour that we've used to test all the, re all the samples with, because we're looking for a colour change from that blue as a starting point, because that's the starting colour of Benedict's. So any colour change from that is, should then be detected by the colorimeter and give us an absorbance measurement. So it's not using clear water this time because we need a blue reference point to start with, because we're looking for any change in the blue colour of Benedict's. OK, so now I've done my blank. I can put my samples into the machine. So I've just put one of my patient samples in as an example and we get an absorbance reading. OK, so I'm going to do that for all of the samples, including the unknown samples, and then we can use those values to create our coloration curve. So with all those readings that we took from the calorimeter, we have now plotted our graph of absorbance against the known concentrations, so my standards, and created this calibration curve. So now we need to use this graph to identify the glucose concentrations in the unknown patient samples. So patient one, the absorbance was 0 0.256. So go and find that on your y-axis, draw a line across. Remember, always, always, always use a ruler so that you do not mess up with this. Um, it's really good to make sure you, when you are asked to do this, whether it's in the exam or in your practical book, to make sure you actually do this on the graph so they can see that you've done this work. Sometimes it can get you marks in the exam as well. Right, so those are our results. So what conclusions can we make from this? Because obviously the whole point of this practical is to practice doing the zero dilution, practice using a colorimeter, but then also using a calibration curve to find concentrations of unknown samples. So normal urine glucose is about 0 to 0 0.8 millimolar. So what does this tell us? It's probably that patient one and patient two have quite normal range of urine glucose, whereas patient three is definitely outside of that range and definitely higher than 0 0.8. OK, so that is this practical done. So the kidneys are part of the urinary system. They have two main roles, the kidneys, as part of this system. Osmoregulation, which is maintaining the water potential of blood. So they help to either remove excess water or they help to retain water if we need to. The other role of the kidneys is to remove protein. So excess protein in the form of urea, take it out of the blood and excrete it out of the body in urine. They are fed in terms of blood and oxygenated blood by the renal artery and then the waste and other things from the kidney the kidney tissues are removed through the renal vein. The filtration process initially removes a lot of things including urea but we don't want all of that to leave the body because some of it is very useful so we need to reabsorb that and make sure that that doesn't get lost in our urine and that process is known as selective reabsorption and then the other process is obviously the osmoregulation and to do with water as well. So we need to be able to label these parts of the kidney. You can see here it's called the cortex. So that's our, the outermost layer of the inside of the kidney. 
and it contains the tops of approximately about 1 million nephrons per kidney. So this is one nephron here, highlighted in green. The top parts are in the cortex, and that is how we carry out most of the filtration and the absorption. And then the parts that extend down into the medulla are mostly used for osmoregulation and water control. You can see one of the structures here sort of taken out of the section of kidney, and we'll look at that in more detail as we go through the, figuring out the processes of reabsorption filtration. Now, the bottom part is the medulla. So the sort of inner layer of the kidney is the medulla, and it contains the tubes that drain the filtered wastes into the renal pelvis. So we can see here we've got some of those tubes of the nephron coming down all the way down through the medulla. And then on the larger diagram, we can see the renal pelvis is kind of like the collection of tubes in the middle to join up to the ureter. That is where the urine travels down to the bladder. So that's the overall structure. We need to remember the cortex is on the outside, the medulla is on the inside. Top parts of the nephron are found in the cortex. The bottom parts of the nephrons are found in the medulla. There's a so the first stage is ultrafiltration, and that is where we are at the glomerulus, which is at the first part, and it involves the fact that there's a wider lumen of the afferent arteriole, so blood coming into the glomerulus, than at the efferent arteriole. So that gives us high hydrostatic pressure and forces small molecules out of the blood's plasma into the Bowman's capsule, which is the kind of cup that surrounds the glomerulus, which is a knot of capillaries. The capillary walls, so the holes in the capillary walls, the fenestrations, the basement membrane and the filtration slits from the podocytes all provide a filter system that prevent large molecules from entering the filtrate that's going to go into the nephron. Next stage is selective reabsorption, where we're going to reabsorb all those useful molecules that we need to keep in the bloodstream. So as the glomerular filtrate, which is what we call it now, it's come out and into the nephron, is moving through the next part of the nephron, which is the proximal convoluted tubule, 85% of it is reabsorbed, including all the glucose, all the amino acids, some ions, and most of the water by osmosis. This happens in the PCT because the cells lining the PCT have got this special adaptations to maximise absorption, similar to the adaptations of cells that line the lumen of the small intestine. So the next stage is kind of where most of the reabsorption of water happens. So the function of the loop of Henle is to create a low water potential in the medulla of the kidney. So you'll see here that the top part, we're looking at the cortex. Now we've moved down to the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle and the collecting duct are in the medulla part of the kidney. So what happens is salts are moved from the ascending limb to the descending limb. So they're actively transported out of the ascending limb and salts diffuse out as well. And they then create a very low water potential in the tissue of the medulla surrounding the loop of Henle. And that causes water to move out of the filtrate in the loop of Henle by osmosis. And it gets reabsorbed into the blood. And you can see that network of capillaries around the loop of Henle. We'll go into detail about how this happens a little bit more because you need to be a bit more specific about how this process actually works. But this basically starts the process of concentrating the urine and removing some of the water. The filtrate then passes up back to the cortex and into the distal convoluted tubule or the DCT. This is where even more water can be reabsorbed into the blood by osmosis. Nothing special happens here other than that as it passes through. If there is more water in, in the filtrate than in the blood vessel surrounding it, then they, it will move out by osmosis. And then finally, we reach the collecting duct. So the collecting duct is where the concentration of urine is controlled. Again, it's in the medulla, and you'll see here that it says that the first part of multiple nephrons can actually drain into a single collecting duct. So you'll see these branches off it, and this is because more than one nephron drain into this collecting duct. And the permeability of the membrane of this collecting duct to water is regulated by the amount of antidiuretic hormone in the blood, or ADH. Osmoreceptors, so receptors that detect the water potential of blood in the hypothalamus, control the release of ADH from the pituitary gland in the brain, and it controls how much water enters the urine. So the loop of Henle is what we call a hairpin countercurrent multiplier, because what it does is it allows the concentration of the filtrate to be increased by reabsorbing water, and it also increases the concentration of the tissue around the loop of Henle in the medulla, in order to help to remove the water, which we'll explain in a second, at the same time. Start with the ascending limb. So remember, that's where fluid is moving towards the cortex. As fluid is moving up the ascending limb, sodium and other ions, 
are actively transplanted out of the filtrate into the tissue fluid. They normally moved out by diffusion at the base, and then as they get fewer ions left in the filtrate as we move up the ascending limb, then we have to start using active transport. What this does is by moving the ions out, is that it lowers the water potential of the surrounding tissue in the medulla. So that's important because what we want that to do is we're going to need that in order to move water out of the filtrate by osmosis. But it doesn't follow the ions on the ascending limb because that is impermeable to water. There's more ions leaving at the base of the loop of Henle because they're diffusing out. As we go up the ascending limb, there's fewer ions, which is why we're having to actively transport it. So more are being lost from the bottom of the loop of Henle. Water potential decreases as you go down further into the medulla. The filtrate coming in at the top of the descending limb is going to have the most water. And so as it moves down, it's going to lose water by osmosis. And so we need to have this concentration gradient where we have high water potential at the top of the descending limb of the loop of Henle and a lower water potential towards the bottom of the descending limb of the loop of Henle to make sure we maintain that concentration gradient of water. So there's always more water in the filtrate than in the tissue fluid outside. And that's going to guarantee that our water is going to leave the descending limb and go into the tissue fluid and then ultimately be absorbed into the capillaries that, remember, are surrounding this loop of Henle. So let's think about what's happening here and just sort of look at it overall, because we've sort of done it backwards because it makes more sense that way. But we started with a lot of water and a lot of ions at the start of the descending limb. As we move down the descending limb, Water is lost due to osmosis because the walls of the descending limb are permeable to water, so it moves out into the tissue fluid surround and ultimately into the capillaries because it's following its concentration gradient. Because the tissue fluid of the medulla has a very, very low water potential because of all the ions that are in it. When we get to the bottom of the loop of Henle, then we start diffusing ions out, so sodium, potassium, chloride ions. So not only have we lost a lot of water by this point, we're now also losing ions. So although we've lost a lot of water, we still have a lot of ions at this point, at the very apex. So that's where we have our lowest water potential of the filtrate because we've lost the water, but we've kept the ions. Once the ions also leave, actually at this point, we have a slightly higher water potential again because we will have some water still left and we've also lost ions. So if we're removing ions, that increases the water concentration and decreases the solute concentration. So we've managed to reabsorb, reabsorb quite a lot of water without needing to expend much energy. Most of it is through diffusion of ions at the bottom of the loop of Henry. We have used a bit of energy for active transport, but because there's no water being able to leave the ascending limb, it's just ions, then we don't very quickly create an equilibrium with that water. We, it only moves out across the other side of the descending limb. Cells in the wall of the collecting duct have receptors for ADH, and they also contain vesicles, which have aquaporins in them. So aquaporins are just channels, protein channels, but specifically for water. OK, so here I have my cells. So the cells are lining the collecting duct. So obviously I've made them really big here, but imagine that they're lining the collecting duct. Then I also have these vesicles. They have the aquaporins attached to them and they are inside the cells. And the aquaporins can be found in the vesicles, but then also in the walls of the collecting duct, the kind of joining part that these cells branch onto. And then I have my ADH receptors as well. Okay, so if there's too little water in the blood, there's not enough water in the blood, ADH is going to bind to the receptors on the collecting duct cells. So here's my ADH binding. And then that causes, in the same way that we've talked about all the other things happening using that secondary messenger cascade, it causes vesicles containing the aquaporins to move towards the membrane where it's joining the collecting duct. What that does is that's going to increase the cell's permeability to water. So it makes it more permeable to water. This results in more water leaving the collecting duct through these aquaporin channels, and then it will move out of those cells and into the bloodstream. So it's going to get reabsorbed into the blood. But most importantly, the water is leaving the filtrate and it's not going to be in the urine. So we create a smaller volume of more concentrated urine. And it's more concentrated because there's less water in it, because we've removed the water and reabsorbed it. Obviously, if we think about the opposite, then the opposite happens. 
So if there's too much water in the blood, less ADH binds to receptors, so there's no ADH or very little ADH binding to receptors at all. The vesicles containing the aquaporins do not move, and so they don't fuse with the membrane. So this makes the membrane of the cells slightly less permeable to water. And so less water leaves the collecting duct and filtrate and goes into the blood. And so we create a larger volume of more dilute urine because more water is going to stay in the collecting duct and more water will end up passing down through and into the urine. And because we've got more water, that dilutes the urea and the other salts and we create more dilute urine. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.